Our first speaker today is none other than Deborah Eschmeyer. She is the executive director and co-founder, she's the executive director of Let's Move and senior policy advisor for nutrition policy in the administration. Deb is not new to this conference and not new to the Farm to Cafeteria movement. She is part of it. I am not gonna read Deb's bio for you, but if you review it, it's pretty clear that Deb has accomplished so much in such a short period of time. She is really the only person I know who is as comfortable showing off her farm in rural Ohio as she is working on a policy campaign, as she is digging in a school garden and now serving in the White House. Deb and I first met in Washington, D.C. We were locked up in a windowless room reviewing grant proposals that took about two or three days. I do not remember who got funded or what got funded during that grant review process, but I do remember Deb's passion and insights into food and farming and what it's gonna change, what it's gonna take to change all the work that we need to do. Um, a few years later, a few years later in 2007, when the National Farm to School Network was formed, Deb joined us as communications and outreach director. And in those early years, the work that we did is really the foundation of the National Farm to School Network and what it is today. So I wanna thank you, Deb, for, for those insights. Please welcome to the stage my friend, Deborah Eschmeyer, Executive Director of Let's Move and Senior Policy Advisor for Nutrition Policy in the White House. <laughs> Whew, I'm gonna get a little emotional after that. Um, good morning. Good morning. Wow, we had a marching band, guys. Good morning. Good morning. We're good? Okay, that's what we're talking about. Um, so thank you, Anu, for that warm introduction. Uh, more importantly, thank you for being such a long-standing dear friend and mentor and leader to this work. Um, it's meant the world to me over the last decade, and uh, it's really just like brings tears to my eyes how much you've meant to me and my family. Um, and thank you to the National Farm to School Network staff and board, to the illustrious fellow speakers that we're gonna be hearing throughout the next couple days. Um, but truly, uh, thank you to all of you. Uh, coming to the eighth National Farm to Cafeteria Conference is like coming to a family reunion. I know many of you sitting here, even though 70% this is new, but there's a lot of friendly faces out there. Um, these remarks were actually quite difficult to keep short, because I have so many stories that I want to tell you. Um, from meeting Michelle Markiston Ratcliffe for the very first time during a regional lead agency meeting and being totally awestruck as she went into the logic model. And she had this like incredible energy and she was talking and then all of a sudden I found out much later in the day that she had not been sleeping more than three hours at a time for almost over a year because she was breastfeeding her youngest son at the time. And I was just like, where is this energy coming from? You're amazing. And then to being so proud to bring Doug Davis to Ohio, to the Ohio Farm to School Conference, and watching him show and teach other esteemed food service directors in the Buckeye State how to manage to buy chicken drumsticks at a competitive price. Or LaDonna Redman, who shared so much wisdom and love to the food corps service members during or orientation with so much grace and sense of self that it's, it's just awe-inspiring. And so I could literally go on for an hour and a half going through all the different stories of so many tremendous leaders in this room. So please do take the time to get to know each other while you're here. Um, so I'm gonna actually just instead try to do a little bit of a thank you as a whole. I wanna thank everyone in here for showing up, for dedicating yourself and the time and the energy to this work, because it is so critically important. Thank you to the farmers out there for sharing your hard work with kids and with community. Thank you to the food service staff and to the teachers for sharing your cafeterias. Thank you for providing the critical importance and value of research <laughs> and evaluation Thank you for demonstrating the power of smart advocacy. Thank you for working with and for community. And thank you for showing to so many people that it is actually possible to shape a career 
that is about something you care deeply about and that you can have fun in the process. And thank you for teaching me and countless others. As you now know, I used to work for the National Farm to School Network just shy of 10 years ago, but one of my responsibilities was answering the info at farmtoschool.org email account. <laughs> Remember that I knew? Yeah. And so I was actually working for the National Network from my hometown in rural West Central Ohio, population 890, uh, while my husband and I were starting our 22-acre fruit and vegetable farm. And I'm answering this email account, and we're talking thousands, thousands of emails that are coming in from farmers and food service directors, local, state, national elected officials, kids, press. They're all asking questions ranging from, what happens to the school garden in the summer? What is a small purchase threshold? Can you please explain geographic preference? But the most common question was, how can I start a farm to school program? And the beauty was that we had the National Farm to School Network there to not only answer that question from people across the country, but we changed that from how can I start a farm to school program to how are we going to make this program possible together. And there's a local, state, regional, and national support network that's there for support because of you, because of the network. And it is truly phenomenal how much this movement has grown. Anupama went through this really quickly, but I'm not sure, since we have so many folks here that you're aware, there were only three states in 1997 that had a farm to school program. And now we have farm to school programs in every state. There are 40 states with supportive policy. <laughs> we actually didn't think that was possible back in 2007, that, that was, we were going to be at this point today. From the 2015 Farm to School Census, we know that there are 42,587 schools across all 50 states in DC that participate in farm to school programs that serve over 23.6 million kids. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing, you guys. And on top of that, during the 2013-2014 school year, these schools purchased nearly $800 million worth of local product. That's a 105% increase. You guys, $800 million. But the point of this is not to just sit and rest in our laurels about those great numbers, but you guys you need to know that this progress was not by accident. This was not luck. This was very intentional. This was very strategic. This was why the network was formed in the first place. Just, let's just take a look at the census tool in and of itself. I'm not talking about what we're actually collecting. I'm just talking about the census tool, guys. That tool and adding those questions took years of work by the network and working with the USDA Economic Research Service. Anupama has scars to prove it. <laughs> it was a process. It took a lot, of, look at look, a lot of conversations and a lot of these kind of meetings. And I'm gonna go and unpack that strategy, strategy just a little bit more because I want you guys to take advantage of like, the why that you're here and the importance of like, collecting your experience and, and, and galvanizing that power. So I'm gonna take you guys back with me to 2009, all right? So I was very fortunate to be a W.K. Kellogg Food and Community Fellow while I was working for the National Farm to School Network, which meant that I was actually able to dedicate time to developing a campaign called One Tray. And this campaign was about connecting local agriculture to federal nutrition programs and strengthening that. And one product of that campaign was a 10-point roadmap of what the USDA could do to help strengthen and support farm to school programs. Remember this, Linda Joe? <laughs> this list of recommendations came about from a series of extensive conversations with school food stakeholders and farmers and you name it, we talked about it, about, okay, what can we do in one year? What can we do in three years? What's a no-cost ask? What's something that's gonna simplify paperwork? What, you know, what are the barriers we need to get through? That document was very creatively called, what can the USDA do? <laughs> it was very practical, guys. This wasn't pie in the sky. This was like, this is very, like, okay, it was beautifully designed. I'll give it that lesson learned from Deborah Kane. Make sure it looks good. But, Looking at that list, and I was actually going over this late last night, it shows how far we've come. It's just tremendous. Just take recommendation number five, 
build a dedicated regional USDA farm to school staff. At the time, there was no federal staff there employed to work with states on farm to school implementation. Not only was there not a national farm to school program at the USDA, there was not what we have now, which is absolutely beautiful, an Office of Community Food Systems at the USDA. And actually, can we just have the USDA farm to school staff that are here, can you stand up? Because I would love to give them a round of applause for all of their tremendous support. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So we're still in 2009, guys. This was a big year. So also at something made possible by the Kellogg Foundation, it was at a Kellogg Food and Community Conference in April that the Food Core founders came together. It was during an open space session. Gotta love those open space sessions. And I had been getting these thousands of emails, right, in my inbox, all right? And I wanted to have another answer for them other than all the resources that we were providing. And we wanted to enhance these programs. And at the same time, we were having this groundswell of young people who wanted to get involved in this work. And there was this tremendous public service tool through the AmeriCorps to make it all possible. So Food Corps sprang from the grassroots. It was this national initiative that was shaped by all of you, by local voices telling us what was needed. We had monthly open conference calls attracting 190 participants to talk about research and evaluation. And we didn't even have a website, guys. <laughs> we had an initial 40-person planning summit that somehow grew to 300 people in a room. With, and ultimately, we actually involved 4,000 stakeholders in developing Food Corps which is now, as many of you know, it's over 200 service members in over 500 schools in 18 states. Do we have Food Corps members, host site su supervisors, folks in the house? All right, let's give them a, a round of applause. I see some of y'all out there. So let's go back to 2009 one more time. So while working for the National Network, I also visited the White House for the very first time. It's a big year, guys. Um, and I met my predecessor, Sam Cass, in the White House kitchen garden. It almost seems like a fairy tale now, actually, now I'm looking back. Um, and it was actually because of our Kellogg Foundation class of fellows uh, was, was being given a tour. And I have to say, do you all remember that euphoric moment when the First Lady broke ground on the South Lawn planting the White House kitchen garden, right? Remember that? As a, as a fruit and vegetable farmer and someone who, who slightly cares about connecting kids to food, community, land, and place, and I've dedicated my life to this, I was really happy. I was like, this is it. This is amazing. I mean, talk about a powerful symbol. It reflects the values of this. Hey, man. That was a food core, man. Um, <laughs> reflecting the values of the first family's dedication to healthy food. We're growing fruits and vegetables on the south lawn of the White House, people. It's beautiful. But not only that, we have the first ever beehive, giving love to our beloved pollinators, because as you all know, they make possible one of every three bites that we take. The first ever compost, showing the importance of healthy soil. We have the first ever pollinator garden, showing the importance of habitat for our bees, birds, and butterflies, and bats. And the thing is, is that this garden is truly a magical place. During the Nordic State Dinner, we, we lit the garden with lanterns and we escorted all of the phenomenal guests through it. It was absolutely magical. And for the First Lady, the garden initiated this national conversation around health and well-being and took it to another level. And it's what eventually evolved into Let's Move. And so for the last year and a half, I have had the incredible privilege of leading the First Lady's Let's Move initiative and being the Senior Nutrition Policy Advisor. And as you know, what Let's Move is all about. It's about raising a healthier generation. And at the launch of Let's Move, I want everyone to know kind of the backing of this because it's really critically important when we think about how we continue to build this work and the tools that we have to continue to embed and institutionalize and grow this work, the things that we need to continue to do. At the launch of Let's Move, President Obama signed a presidential memorandum creating the first ever task force on childhood obesity to conduct a thorough review of every single program and policy relating to child nutrition and physical activity throughout the entire government and to develop a national action plan 
to maximize federal resources and set concrete benchmarks towards the First Lady's goal of raising a healthier generation. The, what came forth was 70 recommendations that were framed around five main pillars. And those are creating a healthy start for children, empowering parents and caregivers, providing healthy food in schools, improving access to healthy, affordable foods, and increasing physical activity. So obviously this has all been line in line with what everything y'all have been doing and why you're here. And a part of this approach is that everybody has had a role to play. Everyone, from private sector to foundations, to local elected officials, parents, everyone's been involved in this. And as you know, the First Lady has dedicated much of her platform to making the healthy choice the easy choice and pulling the cultural levers that are essential to changing attitudes and behaviors. Who else does a Vine chat and responds to a question with her now iconic turn up for what video? or has a push-up contest with Ellen and wins to showcase the importance of physical activity, or runs around the White House during the Easter egg roll in a, in a 5K with the kids, or in an episode of Billing on the Street to promote fruits and vegetables, she slow danced with Big Bird in a supermarket while Billy Eichner serenaded her with an Aerosmith song. <laughs> that happened my first week on the job, people. Um, it has been a total dream to work in this administration. And every day I am driven and inspired by their authentic and incredible dedication, authentic dedication and leadership to these issues. It is, it's, it's a gift. And beyond all this unprecedented policy progress and how far we've come here today, which I will actually continue to take a moment to reflect on, their leadership and character have truly contributed to this culture shift and momentum that is unparalleled. And it is, it's truly what public health campaigns are, are built and made of. But I wanna give you some quick stats that, and I know I'm gonna throw a whole bunch of numbers at you here now, but I want you to know and truly understand the impact that we've had due to the last six years of effort. If a child born today, right, is going to go to a daycare center, they now may be one of 1.6 million kids that are going to a daycare center where fruits and vegetables have replaced cookies and juice. Now when a child goes into school, they'll be joining 30 million kids that have healthier school lunches. They could be one of the 2 million kids that have a Let's Move salad bar in her school, or nearly 9 million kids that now have a Let's Move active school that have 60 minutes of physical activity a day. Or they may be in a city or town or county like one in four Americans that are now part of Let's Move Cities, Towns, and Counties movement, where you can walk on new sidewalks, you can participate in a summer meal program or a local athletic league. Or that child would be one of 8.1 million folks in underserved areas who finally have somewhere to buy groceries, groceries that are a whole lot healthier since food and beverage companies have cut 6.4 trillion calories from their products. And all of that has been made possible by multiple public-private partnerships and private sector commitments. So a lot has been happening over the last six years, but I want to do a quick run of some federal policy progress so you guys can continue to hold strong to this and help grow it. You guys are familiar with this one, but in 2013, but since 2013, the USDA has provided 20 million in farm to school grants for 295 projects. The USDA has expanded access to healthy foods in underserved communities by making EBT available at farmers markets. And Nupama touched on this, but 6,400 markets now accept SNAP benefits, up from 750 in 2008. In 2008, annual SNAP redemption at farmers markets was 2.7 million. It rose to 19.4 million by 2015, which is 620% increase. Between 2009 and 2015, the USDA invested over one billion dollars in more than 40,000 local and regional food businesses and infrastructure projects. Between 2013 and 2015, the USDA made over 900 infrastructure investments that better connect communities with locally grown healthy food options. This is food, this is food hubs, cold, cold storage for fruits and vegetables, processing facilities, the local regional food distribution networks. Since 2009, the number of food hubs around the country has grown by nearly 100%. There's now 300 operational around the country. And on average, each food hub supports 20 jobs and generates nearly 4 million in annual sales. 
And I have, I have, I seriously have like two pages of this, so I'm gonna keep, the, I'm gonna cut it short because it is unbelievable how much we have accomplished with local and regional food. Um, but I want that for the farmers in the room, over the past seven years, the USDA has provided 237,000 direct and guaranteed farm ownership and operating loans, totaling $33 billion to ag entrepreneurs in need, 80% to which have gone to beginning farmers and socially disadvantaged producers. The USDA has now allotted $5.6 billion for programs serving new and beginning farmers and ranchers through 2017. That's huge. <laughs> this is billions, guys. And through the Healthy Food Financing Initiative, over six, 165 million in federal grants have been distributed to the community development financial institutions, leveraging over $1 billion. And all of these numbers are impressive, and it's, sometimes it's hard to soak that all in at once, but I just, I want, I want you all to understand the incredible investment and priority that this administration has made on local and regional food distribution systems and how we need to push and continue that forward. And it depends on all of you to do that and to prove the case and to make sure that none of this goes away. And this actually goes back into some of the great work that was accomplished through the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, which I know so many folks worked on in 2010, and I'm so grateful to all of you for doing that. And now we have 98% of schools in the United States who are meeting those healthier food standards. Um, but one piece of that that I want to lift up that I'm not sure folks are aware of, we also launched the community eligibility provision under the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act to help high poverty schools serve healthy free breakfast and lunch to all students. And currently, more than 17,000 schools in high poverty areas are offering nutritious meals to over 8 million students at no cost. So, that's just USDA, and I haven't even had time to go to other agencies. But just really quickly on FDA, because I have to say we're, this is some big things that have just occurred, but you all know the FDA finalized the role that trans fats are no longer considered generally recognized as safe. So, you know, eliminating trans fats from the food supply is a big deal, and it's going to save tens of thousands of lives. And the first, for the first time in 20 years, this is something we recently announced on May 20th, and we're so, so thrilled about. The FDA finalized the new and improved Nutrition Facts label. Um, woo! Huge. It is a refresh designed with the relevant scientific nutrition information and actually showing you what you need to know. It has more realistic serving size, a bigger font for calories to showcase the, the calorie count to make it easier for people to read, and the information about how much sugar was added during processing and how much comes from ingredients like fruit that will now be on over 800,000 food products. It's one of the most um, reproduced graphic design labels in the world. Um, and that was a monumental effort, and we're, we're so glad that's over the finish line. Um, and I don't have enough time to go into all of the uh, 225 corporate commitments that the Partnership for Healthy America has spearheaded with private sector uh, communities. However, I do want to tell you about two marketing campaigns because this might be beneficial to the work that you're doing in your communities. So you all know better than anyone that we need to get kids excited about healthy food and what's, what's good for them. So what we've been really working hard on is using fresh and relevant messages and meeting kids where they're at. So we've been trying to use the power of advertising in our favor. It's, and in, you all know this is no easy task, and you do this every day, that there's nearly two billion spent annually on advertising food to youth, and less than 1% of that is spent on marketing fruits and vegetables. And considering half your plate is supposed to be fruits and vegetables, we have some work to do to, to change that. So we know advertising works, so why don't we just all get in the game? So what we've done with the Partnership for Healthy America is that we've built this iconic marketing campaign called FNV. And basically, it's targeted for millennials. And we're utilizing celebrities like Steph Curry and Cam Newton and Jessica Alba and Jar Jordan Sparks and dozens of others. Actually, there's 70 celebrities who have offered themselves at no cost for this campaign. And we're doing really fun and relevant ads for fruits and vegetables. You have to check it out at FNV. Um, and in just this last year, FNV has had more than 1 billion media impressions, and 70% of people who saw the campaign said they ate more produce as a result. And we're not even a year into the campaign, and it's going to continue to grow nationwide. 
And that same idea, and actually you should really check into that because you can bring FNV into your schools and into your communities. It's something that's available for everyone. The same idea underlies a campaign by the Produce Marketing Association called Eat Brighter, through which Sesame Street is allowing the Produce Marketing Association retailers to use the Sesame Street characters without a licensing fee to promote fruits and vegetables in over 30,000 grocery stores. So think like Elmo on apples. I mean, this is why the First Lady was dancing with Big Bird, was to promote the, the Eat Brighter campaign. And the thing is, is that it's been working. And some retail industries have been using the campaign. They've shown an 11% increase in sales of fruits and vegetables because they put, in, they put Elmo on broccoli. Um, you guys, it works. They're super cute. So I don't have time to walk through all the layers of progress. And, um, and I know you get restless when you hear about all the good work because we know we all have a lot of challenges as well. But I will commit to you all that I will put together a laundry list of all of the progress to date so that you have a one-stop shop of all that the administration has been working on to continue to preserve the progress of all of your great work and that way you can continue to go back to that. So, you all represent what is possible in this work and the power in changing these systems to set the trajectory of children across the country to be healthier and to actually achieve greater success in life. And you all know we have a lot of work to do. We do. That's why we're here. <laughs> and I ask, like Anu did, that you truly take advantage of the brilliance in this room, of the kindness and the creativity and the compassion and use it to its greatest extent. I want you all to share your challenges and share your data and share your stories and make sure that you're not ever only talking to the people that you know. You really gotta make new friends and new networks while you're here and really think outside the box about what else we could do. I mean, if we all were sitting in the same corners and not talking to each other, there never would have been a food core. There never would have been a network, you know? It's because we all were talking together about how we could be better, bigger and better and smarter. And we have to all work closely together to continue to craft, implement, and preserve smart policy. What is the next document of what can the USDA do? What is, the, what is possible in the next one to three year time frame? Keep spelling that out, keep pushing that, keep making it possible. And we must be deeply strategic on what is achievable under current political and cultural conditions and realize who are the partners and coalitions that we could be continuing to build to achieve these goals. The president reminds us that we must continue to do all that we can, which I promise on my part that we will do. I'm so deeply encouraged by our collective progress, and I am more than thrilled to have a first lady that is dedicated to this issue for the long term, which I know is something that everybody wants to know. <laughs> That is maybe the number one question that I get. And the thing is, as she recently said at the, at the PHA summit, this is just phase one of our work together. We are only just beginning. The First Lady is dedicated to this well beyond leaving the White House. <laughs> And something else that she said was that we've been finding innovative and inspirational new ways to raise awareness and create new products and build new programs and policies. And if we truly want to achieve our goal, we're going to need to continue to scale up these efforts. And we need to give them time to actually have their intended impact. In this next phase, we're going to need to get even more creative, even more innovative. We've got to find new ways to reach these kids in ways they will actually hear it, which is why we have a White House Kitchen Garden Instagram account. <laughs> you guys should check it out. You can actually watch the garden grow. It's pretty cool. The White House has a Snapchat account, guys. Um, so we're, we're meeting kids where they're at. But we're also needing to make sure that we still have patience, and I mean real patience, and, and making sure that what we're doing is we're, that it's going to work, and we're going to be we're going to persevere, and we're going to stay strong and stay committed to this. This is not some trendy issue. This is something that you have to stay dedicated to in a long haul, and you all know that. That's why you're here. That's why this is a community-based approach, right? We know that. And so, the thing is, is that 
it's some days are really really long at the White House, and it's it truly is a privilege to to serve in every single day. But I have to tell you that there are many days. What keeps me going, keeps me positive, is knowing that you guys are out there. You know, knowing that I have you guys, that you are the ones on the ground pushing the envelope. That you are, you are in the schools, you are on the farms, that you're doing this day day in and day out. I think about the food corps service members. I think about reading the re the reflection logs and all the beauty and the new questions and the new passion that's in those, this work. And that just continued to drive me to do more, and it continues to drive me every day. When I walk through the doors of the White House, I think about all of you and I think about all the work that you're doing and that is what continues to drive me in, in service because it is a gift to be able to do this work. It is a privilege to do something you're passionate about and we, shouldn't, we should not take that for granted. So my final, uh, my final words to you are around ensuring that you really are digging deep about what's next. You know, where, what, is, what are we doing moving forward with the farm to school work? You know, what are we doing with, in general, what's the vision that we want to all be achieving together by 2030? And we, that we are being as strategic as possible and we are thinking big and bold and visionary because we have only just begun. We've learned so much. The first lady is, I've never seen her more energetic about this issue. I've never seen her more passionate about it. And it's because like there's it's because of the energy. It's because we know that it, we know what works, guys. We too. We know it. We see it. We've seen the transformation that happens when we do this work with kids. We all do, right? And this is like, okay, so then how do we make it so that every kid in the country has this? That is our goal. This is when every child in America deserves to grow up healthy. That is why we're here. That is why we're taking it to the next level. It is not going to be fully successful until we're well past that 23 million figure, guys. Like, this is, this is your challenge. This is our challenge. And what is big and bold and visionary? What, what do you got? What do you have? You know? And tell me. I'm in this for the long haul. So is the First Lady. Keep coming up with new ideas, guys. Keep, keep coming. We want to hear it. Don't go silent on us. <laughs> we need you more than ever. And so I, I just I want you to know like, how grateful, seriously grateful, this administration is for each and every one of you. You are so incredibly valuable. And whenever you have any self-doubt about doing this work and that it's not, just know that. Remember this moment. Remember the First Lady thanking you and being so grateful for it. And I really, really, truly hope that you can enjoy all that Madison has to offer. This is close enough to my hometown of Ohio that I feel the, feel the pride. Um, I was also in a marching band, so I just have to say that I love every bit of that. Um, <laughs> But um, I just I want to send you all my, my greatest love, and I hope that if you are ever finding yourself in D.C., please do let me know so I can, I can show you the garden. Um, but thank you all. Uh, thank you for, for everything that you've done to, to teach me, and thank you for being with, with us every step of the way. We've got a lot of work to do. Have fun.